Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to this risk.net webinar in association with Quantify. My name is Zoe Pletcher, and our topic for the next hour is The Future is Now, How Data Science is Revolutionizing Risk Management and Finance. Data science is playing an increasingly pivotal role across capital markets with the potential to transform decision making in investment securities. With the vast and growing volumes of unstructured data available in this area, buy-side and sell-side firms are grappling with the tools to better understand risks and opportunities in systematic market making, algorithmic trading, risk management and compliance and regulatory reporting. So how are firms using data science tools to deliver insights and inform decisions there? And what are the systems, skills and resources firms need to be able to implement them? Here to discuss this, we're absolutely delighted to have a highly qualified panel. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, and tell us briefly about their roles and interest in this topic. Um, so, Victor, would you like to kick us off? Yes, of course. Thank you for the introduction. So, I'm Victor Daniel Cadas Hernandez. I am the Global Head of Machine Learning, Artificial Intelligence, and Data Science in JP Morgan, particularly for technology. And my interest is particularly in Bayesian theory, non parametric. Uh, techniques and reinforcement learning in general. I'll pass it to Francois. Francois. Hi, everyone. So my name is Francois Mercier. I'm a data scientist for City. My interest is generally speaking about applying machine learning uh, in finance, uh, but currently with my mandate, I'm applying machine learning and data science more for uh, market surveillance and also for electronic communication surveillance. Thanks. And Michael? Michael, would you like to introduce yourself? We can't actually hear you. Um, I'll just go to Alexi for, for a moment. Um, could you introduce yourself and then we'll come sure. back to Michael? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alexey Chernitzer. Uh, I'm in charge of product management here in uh, Quantify. Uh, we are a software provider specializing in risk analytics and uh, trading. Uh, most of my prior experience is in uh, credit trading, both on the structure and the uh, flow side. But uh, I was always very interested in uh, data science, specifically in machine learning applications in finance. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, and then, um... As we can't we can't hear you at the moment, Michael. Um, so uh, Michael Natush is the chief science officer at Prudential, uh, and hopefully um, we'll we can we'll be able to hear from him uh, shortly. Um, but in the meantime, a warm welcome to you all and uh, to our audience as well. And before we begin, just a quick reminder to our audience that you can submit your questions for the Q and A um, via the platform at any time. Um, we'll pick up as many of those as we can in real time uh, and then follow up with any others during the Q&A discussion at the end. Uh, and we'll also be posting some poll questions as we go. So please do take the opportunity to get involved. Uh, I wanted to start by exploring how data science is changing decision making in the context of investment securities. But I think it would be helpful if we first define what we mean by data science in this context. So, Francois, I wonder if we can come to you first with that one. Uh, how do you define data science in this context? Yeah, sure. Uh, just before to answer the, uh, this question, just uh, the usual disclaimer uh, to state that uh, what I'm going to say is simply uh, my own view and not uh, the one of City. And I guess it's the same for, uh, for the rest of the panel. But uh, to come back to the question, which I think is a very uh, uh, interesting question, actually a very hard question to answer. Uh, I think there are different ways to, uh, to define data science. And I guess it depends from where we're coming from. Uh, so uh, one way could be to have a more scientific uh, or data-driven uh, approach for decision making. Uh, and it could be like a way to try to find, for example, causality. Uh, which could be very useful for, um, uh, for I mean, especially in finance, uh, since uh, it's uh, very hard to know what caused what. Uh, another perspective could be uh, perhaps more from a business point of view. It's try to uh, apply science, but for business needs, and it's less uh, formal than the science that you may do uh, 
for fundamental research in academia and so on. And the last one, maybe from a technology point of view, it could be more a more sophisticated way or approach to automate some processes. Uh, so there are kind of three different perspectives, and I don't think there is a single one uh, to, uh, to to define as a sense. Great, thank you. Um, and then, um, Michael, have we have we got you back yet? I wanted Let's to come hope to you. You can hear me. Fantastic. Um, yes. Great. Thank you. Um, no, obviously, uh, totally agree with what with what, uh, what Francois just said. Um, I think the, um, the the real value that we can exploit here comes from the fact uh, that um, data science is, as Francois mentioned, yeah, it's bottom up. It's data driven rather than top down sort of model or human hypothesis driven, and that gives us a completely different point of view at um, the kind of different problems that we're looking at. So um, any, uh, if, if we say, you know, how do we define data science in this context? It's really sort of a bottom-up, data-driven, probabilistic approach that captures not just sort of the traditional numerical variables, but also sort of categorical variables, or any other input data that we're looking at. And obviously, there's there's a connection. Not it's not data science is not in isolation. You know, we're also looking at it in relationship with sort of things like alternative data, you know, where we wouldn't otherwise have a handle on these kind of things if it wasn't for the kind of tools that data science provides for us. Great. Um, and then uh, coming to you, Victor, how how do you define data science? I mean. If data science, I hope that people understand that it's a science, meaning that if you don't have a hypothesis, you cannot test anything. So first is the how to not define it. It's not a magic button that you click and it solves your problems. You have to state a hypothesis. And as Michael was saying, in a data-driven way, you would demystify or not. The term data is that data is widely available. So whatever you can measure is the thing that you can work with. So it goes really tight with what are the sensorial tools, meaning that what are you measuring in order for you to enable data science that hopefully will cover what is the tech stack that you actually need to deploy these things really efficiently into any production application slash business. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you. And Alex, say what would uh, what would be your take on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, um, I would I would only add that. Uh, um, I would, for myself, define data science uh, in a very broad uh, way as a set of uh, whole set of new technologies which uh, which we are using now to analyze uh, large data sets. And uh, in the practical terms in finance, uh, data science found its way in almost every aspect of uh, of the industry. And uh, some of the examples, uh, I guess, uh, which we probably will touch upon today. Uh, would include, uh, uh, you know, analysis of trading signals, decision making, algorithmic trading, systematic market making, optimization of uh, derivatives uh, calculations. So, uh, all of these uh, use cases would use data science in one form or another. Great. Um, yeah. So we will come to that, and uh, but um, we know sort of, I guess, uh, around which technologies or methodologies we're talking about. Um, but I just want to play devil's advocate a little bit. So, I mean, do we actually need data science in decision making? Um, and Michael, perhaps I could come to you first uh, on this. What value does data science add to decision making in this context? Uh, I, th I think it's, um, um, it's if you're the pilot in an airplane and you just have the speedometer in front of you, um that that's probably not going to be terribly helpful you you want some the altimeter as well and you want not just uh one pressure gauge but you could you want a whole bunch of them around the airplane so um and i think the the, the use of data science for us is really in uh, having different angles on the same problem you know we if, if you look at um um if you look at a, a particular business problem or a particular finance problem that you're interested in just with your traditional tool set, then you will just see uh, the problem just that one angle that you've already traditionally looked at. 
But if you can look at the same problem from lots of different angles, you can all of a, all of a sudden see, you know, this is how it actually looks like in, in the full light of day. And I think um, none of us really can afford anymore to, to, to miss that point of view. Uh, that I think that's, that really describes the value as far as I'm concerned of what we're trying to bring to us, our, ourselves and our colleagues. Uh, and Alex, say um, what, in your view, is the value that data science adds to decision making? What does it bring us that we didn't have previously? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it uh, brings a huge amount of uh, value and in ways which uh, weren't possible before. Um, while it is true that, uh, you know, a lot of the models and theory uh, behind data science has existed for a long time and uh, uh, we didn't used to call it data science before, like uh, as an example, regression models, for example, have been around for a long time, but uh, it is only recently that we combined it with uh, the uh, computational power, which uh, is exponentially growing. And this is a relatively new phenomenon and is growing uh, uh, very, very fast. And uh, so now combine, combining the uh, theory, some new and some traditional, uh, with this new technology, uh, what we have now as a result is that uh, the ability, uh, uh, our ability now to analyze structured and unstructured data uh, is limited only by the computational capacity, and uh, that uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, increasing in uh, in an explosive way. So uh, uh, our decisions, therefore, are much better uh, informed if we're using frameworks uh, which are data science and machine learning enabled. Fantastic, and yeah, and we'll come back, we'll come back to that point as well. Um, and uh, Victor, what's your take on this? I mean, there are two parts. One is the actual problem that you want to solve, like taking Michael's approach, like, hey, you have an airplane, right? But imagine, do you you want to buy groceries to your grocery store? It's two blocks away. Do you need an airplane to go there? Probably not. So if you are developing huge tools and using bazookas to just travel one block, you're overcomplicating the problem. Now, if you actually think of portfolio management, imagine that, hey, I want my sharp ratio to be infinite. Like basically a money-making formula. Since the problem is so open-ended, that's when you throw everything you have at that problem. And that's when data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, there are techniques where no theoretical solution is possible, but approximation solutions are the ones that you need will help you drive the value. Hey, look, my sharp ratio from exit strategy went from 2 to 2.5. We know that that's a huge amount of of alpha that you capture just by doing machine learning. And now those are the things that do materialize as value because the problem has inherent value also to, to achieve. So I hope that people can think of first, is the business problem enough of it ended to be machine learning applicable? And then you apply all the, the techniques because without a business problem, we will find you can throw all the machine learning that you can do and it literally won't have any, any results. From it. And one last thing is that don't think it's Skynet. Basically, it won't replace us. No, no. We are human assisted from AI, meaning that AI is here to help us do better things instead of replacing us. Because there's some sometimes some fear and so people kind of neglect to adopt, but it's not, not neglect to adopt. Imagine it's like your cell phone. It's just another tool that you will use to do your work a little bit better. So that's a value added, like another hand. Would you be like to having two heads and four hands? I say, yeah, it might be more efficient. Okay, think of AI in those terms. Fantastic. Um, we do actually have a question from the audience. I don't know if you want to touch on this, Victor, before uh, before we move uh, on to Francois. But um, I, I think the audience here is also playing a bit devil's advocate and saying, um, you know, he's heard from data scientists that using data science to predict markets yields no fruit and is a waste of everyone's time. Would you agree with this or, or disagree? I mean, uh, if when, when you go to the art of the possible on prediction, the thing that people normally try to predict is price because it's the thing that you observe, right? But if you accept that pricing is not the thing that you want to predict, but you want to predict intention, or you want to predict hidden variables, that's when the problem gets really interesting. If you know hidden Markov models, hidden Markov models are really well known framework that you use proxy variables in order to do predictions. 
Imagine this, you don't want to predict the price, but you want to predict direction. That's a whole different problem. And you can search for research that there's some alpha. It used to be some alpha, now it's really extracted, so probably you won't find that much. But the new world, for example, in fidelity, using inverse reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning combined, where you predict the intention of a portfolio manager, and you don't accept that the portfolio manager is perfect, you say, yeah, you're a human, you make mistakes either in execution, in portfolio optimization, but there's an intention. Can we use machine learning to materialize that intention way better? And you have way better uh, beta tracking, meaning that your sort of your deviation from a benchmark perspective in a passive portfolio is way better than a traditional portfolio manager. So you are seeing that from a particular objective, you are yielding way better results than human. That's the whole point, right? If you frame the problem in a correct fashion, you will get better results. But something as simple as, hey, I'm going to build, a, I don't know, a transformer or sequence to sequence on an LSTM to predict the market for tomorrow. If that's so, Jan LeCun will be filthy rich. Then you have other people like the Godfathers of AI. They won't be doing research. They will be enjoying Ferraris and Jad mansions and, and just spending their money, right? Why? Because price hopefully is contain enough of information that you cannot predict. But the hidden variables is when you can do some some interesting things. And even if I can expand a little bit on, it's actually JP Morgan work, where we, we use deep hedging, which is one of the well-known that we have, is how can you quote or how can you price derivatives that are more obscure than the actual normal derivatives, meaning that illiquid derivatives. It's not so uh, common to do that uh, for, a let's say, a desk really often. But if you read this work, machine learning is helping you to price things in obscure markets. So there's a lot of things going on there. Great, thanks, uh, Victor. And then coming back to you, Francois, um, I guess on the original question of, you know, what value does data science add to decision making? And if you wanted to add anything to what Victor said there um, in response to the audience's question. Yes, sure. So for me, I think we need to think like, okay, the best intelligence that we've got right now is still the human intelligence by far, uh, like despite all the, what we say about AI and so on. But it doesn't mean that it's best at everything. And there are some weaknesses of uh, the human intelligence. The first one is that we, can, we cannot handle a very large amount of data. So uh, since like we come back to finance and decision making, uh, we, a human will be very good by following, let's say, uh, two uh, securities and, and that's it. But if we want to go through the whole universe of securities, you cannot uh, have humans uh, to track everything. So you need to have like an automated process and data science approach are usually the most advanced one uh, in terms of the performance. So it's one of the, uh, uh, one of the added value. Uh, also, uh, we need also uh, to, um, Usually we need to make progress and to make progress, we need to measure it. And the measure is always coming from the data. And so we have to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to get some data driven approach for that. Uh, and, and the last one is also still to come back to the human weakness is that our intelligence, it's not rational that you could have in reinforcement learning and so on. Uh, we do have like some bias due to evolution or whatever it is. Uh, and those bias make, make, has to not really, uh, we, we cannot trust ourselves at 100%. Uh, so like, especially in finance, so like all the behavioral finance, for example, uh, will exploit this idea that actually people are, are doing uh, something which is not rational. And so having a data science approach can be like, okay, a way to detect potentially some bias that we may have. Uh, and it may help uh, to have a complement to what a human may, may think. Uh, and to come back also to the question about like, okay, why it is hard to, uh, to generate alpha. There are different ways uh, to, to answer that. But one is like the finance, unlike trying to predict cat and dogs, uh, is always changing. A cat and dog doesn't change much, uh, to be honest. So it's really easy to have a supervised learning approach to uh, to try to classify uh, if the image is a cat or a dog. Uh, but in finance, the world of two months is definitely a different world than right now. So which bring a, an issue of, okay, the way that we usually, when we talk about machine learning, we usually talk about supervised learning. And so we test on a specific uh, a test set, 
But this test set is not the one, is not the same distribution as the one that we've got in the real world, real world a uh, few days later. So there are different approaches uh, to try to tackle that, but it's still definitely on the research side, like uh, such as uh, continual learning or in reinforcement learning as well. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, that's why I think data science is very important in decision making, especially in finance since the real world is so uh, so adverse to you, in fact. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Francois. Um, we're actually now going to turn to our first poll question. I understand this has been live for a little bit, so I think that, um, you know, I'll just read it out uh, for everyone, um, but then we can probably get the results uh, up fairly quickly. So the question was, to what extent do you agree that data science delivers better decisions than has been possible in the investment security space previously. Um, and so, yeah, similar to the question that I've asked you, and um, perhaps we could have the, the results on screen there. Uh, yeah, great. So it looks like um, the, the majority agree um, that it delivers better decision make, uh, decisions than previously. Um, so um, perhaps, um, Francois, I could, um, come to you for your reaction on that? Is, is that what you were expecting? Uh, yes, also because it's biased, I guess, in terms of the selection of people uh, in the audience. I guess people will <laughs> attend to uh, thinking that they are interested in data science, I guess. Uh, so it so could be also one way to, to see it. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, generally speaking, I think it's uh, it's something which uh, it's just my my belief is that it makes market more efficient. Uh, so there are a lot of debate about is market efficient or not. It's just an approximation. But there is one thing that I think it's very uh, aligned with at least what the society wants. It's to uh, uh, related to climate change. So I know like in ESG, so that's what I'm talking about. Uh, like it's a one ESG. Uh, it's one way to try to price externalities which will come from uh, economic uh, activities and so on. Uh, I know there are greenwashing and no, nothing is perfect for, uh, at all with that. Uh, but it's definitely one, uh, one thing which, with the help of data science, because to have ESG factor, you basically need to, uh, to pass new data, especially text data in terms of disclosure and so on, uh, to try to, uh, uh, to create those, those factors. But it's one thing to try to align financial market, the pricing with what the society wants uh, at the end. And this is one thing also that I'm more interested in and, and which, uh, which I think is beneficial for all market participants and actually for the society as well. Great, fantastic. So yeah, some of the benefits there, of uh, data science in, in decision-making for market participants. Thanks for that. Um, and so we've talked about data science in theory, and now we come to the more substantial question of how data science is being applied to decision making in the, in the investment security space. Um, I think Alex, they touched on this earlier, but um, Victor, I'd like to come to you first and ask you about the sort of the art of the possible, as you so wonderfully put it earlier. What is your experience of use cases in systematic market making? Um, perhaps algorithmic trading, risk management and compliance, or regulatory reporting? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's a broad plethora of things that are applicable. So as I quoted before, deep hedging was kind of a before and after because it's a challenge to black skulls. We know black skulls is kind of super well known for pricing derivatives, but now it's like, hey, you don't need the partial differential equation anymore because these things are so good as approximator functions that you can use them without feature engineering and you will get to the same uh, Greeks, like that's the representation of risk for us in the derivatives space. But when you go into risk measures like CUR, that is a little bit more robust as, as we know why than the bar, you get way better risk measures on the actual hedging with transaction costs, and you can see those things, and you can read the paper and go into the details. So it's kind of puzzling, like, hey, you don't need the analytical approach because these things actually approximate more. But the question is, why? It's because if you rationalize how you model mathematically stuff, you make assumptions, right? And as Michael was saying, since this is data-driven, there's no assumption as the data. Like, look, 
this is the measurement, you figure it out. Now there's no mathematical rationalization in between that will remove frictions in order to have a beautiful equation. It's more like, no, throw this thing, computer power, throw this thing, data, and let it converge. And that's why you can see that the art of the possible is expanding to, to machine learning, prefer things, but then it comes the difficulty from the, let's say, compliance regulatory. Hey, these things may take decisions. How do I de-risk them? So now you have machine learning to survey machine learning. Like you have sharp value, you have line, you have these techniques that white box, the black box. So it's kind of funny. You have a machine learning over here making decisions. You have a machine learning over there ensuring that the decision of the other machine learning is actually proper. But when the human comes into place and it becomes like a complex ecosystem, but, but I can see this evolving in really interesting ways. And it's actually driving academia insanely because the problems are really, really complicated. And, and it's all over systematic trading, algorithmic trading, risk management, and regulatory. So I think this covers the broad plethora. Great, thank you. Um, and then just um, coming to uh, Francois on this, on this same question as well. So, so for um, me, yeah, for me, it's a bit everywhere. It's like uh, what uh, Andrew Eng is saying that uh, machine learning is kind of the new electricity. I know it's kind of a really a buzz, uh, a keyword uh, to um, to create a buzz and so on. But just to give some example, it's used in asset pricing. So it was mentioned with alternative data, for example, for uh, uh, to for financial uh, uh, behavioral financial uh, finance sorry uh, for uh, ES to incorporate also ESG factors. It's also used quite a lot to be honest on operational workflow improvements. So just a, a second way to automate things like uh, with contracts uh, to and so on. Used in surveillance uh, as I'm do, uh, working on. Uh, it's also used in portfolio construction and in index tracking. Uh, also, a bit more, I guess, age, but uh, for uh, backtesting, uh, like a trading algorithm, uh, algorithmic trading, sorry, uh, that uh, which could be done in a simulated market using a multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, but to, to be honest, most of the time, it's usually relatively simple models, so like uh, linear regressions, uh, but with a very strong uh, domain knowledge. And my guess uh, is that where it will be uh, the most useful for investment securities, it will be for causal uh, inference uh, in order to try to uh, to take better decisions. This will be my guess. Fantastic. Uh, and then could I come to you, Michael, and what's what's your experience of, of these um, tools in, in which use cases? Yeah, maybe if I could pick up on um, one of the points that Francois just mentioned, which is sort of more on the surveillance side. Um, and, and the reason why, why, why I picked that one is because it's sort of uh, distinctly different from, you know, uh, we've mentioned between us a couple of times th things like uh, sort of uh, regression and all these kind of things. But just to look at it from a sort of conduct, a conduct and behavior point of view, you know, there's something around anomaly detection can I see amongst uh, the, 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 our colleagues and their you know, daily or hourly, um, weekly, monthly kind of behavior patterns, any kind of outliers that are significant? You know, it's, uh, it's that, that kind of understanding. And traditionally, we would obviously, um, you know, we, we would obviously apply a whole bunch of rules and then check whether these rules are being violated. And our colleagues in risk and compliance love stuff like that because they love defining tick boxes that we can then either uh, tick or, or leave blank. Uh, but actually, what we really want to understand is what is the stuff that we are not yet thinking about? You know, that's much more interesting. And, and uh, you know, the kind of techniques that are sort of uh, home to our profession are really useful for that kind of understanding. Fantastic. Um, and Alexei, would you have anything to add here in terms of what you're seeing? Uh, uh, firms uh, using these tools in? Sure, uh, uh, sure. Um, I mean, we have uh, a, a range of different clients who who use uh, um, 
the data science and machine learning techniques to apply to many different uh, in many different ways to uh, to solve problems that they're facing and some of them actually do have uh, to do with uh, predictive pricing even though there was some skepticism, uh, skepticism uh, uh, about this but uh, people do use it to to generate uh, signals for liquid and also more importantly for liquid securities where you perhaps don't have that much price data available that is where it's uh, very useful. Of course, there's algo trading, and uh, uh, we have clients uh, applying uh, applying it to uh, less liquid spaces, for example, uh, like uh, municipal bond trading and uh, various relative value strategies, so which are based on uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning data science. Uh, but for me personally, uh, one of the most interesting applications is what uh, I think we see quite a lot from the sell side and uh, the banks trying to uh, automate some of the functions that uh, uh, traditionally were done by uh, by human traders, uh, especially the market makers, where uh, where uh, we have quite a programmatic uh, sort of uh, approach to what needs to be done in order to respond to an RFQ, and uh, this is a task which uh, most traders do many many times a day, but it's definitely a task that uh, a computer can do as well, and uh, uh, emulating this uh, behavioral uh, aspect of uh, a human market maker that is uh, uh, the one which uh, I kind of like the best uh, in terms of the applications. Fantastic. Thanks, Alexei. Um, and um, we're going to um, move on to discuss uh, about data science tools. So we've discussed what data science can do for firms in this context, but how do they use it and make all this data work for them? Um, so actually, let's first look at the growing volumes of data and their significance. Uh, and Francois, could I come to you first with that? So how has the explosion of data driven the need for new tools in data science? So I guess it's like uh, everywhere else, at least it, I, I think it's more in it, anyway the, the tech industry which is driving uh, finance rather than the reverse, maybe before it was the case. Uh, but it's mostly like uh, my experience, it's like at the beginning, like. Ten years ago, it was all about big data, trying to store the data to make it uh, uh, possible to query the data, to extract what we needed, and so on. Uh, now it's more about the compute, so more definitely having like access to GPUs, which is needed for uh, for, for deep learning, for example, or for other uh, other machine learnings. And and what we see also, is like in terms of uh, in, in the software, so it's not necessarily talking for uh, for finance, but the the stack which is used it's a, being more and more mature more following like a software engineering uh, type of uh, typical um, uh, uh, timeline so initially it was a low level uh, framework with let's say pytorch uh, or um, or tensorflow Teano, and so on and now it's more like high level a deep learning framework with PyTorch Lightning or Hanging Face, which come with one issue that I guess we will talk a bit later, but how we manage to uh, cope with all of these uh, these changes because they are very hard to uh, uh, it's very hard to follow all which is uh, uh, all the new tools that we we've got. But uh, yeah, this is really my answer. Thank you. Um, and then coming to you, Michael, on on the same question. I, uh, I think so the, it's sorry uh, um, it, it, on on the on the tool side. I, I think it's not just about the tools, and obviously there there's plenty of uh, you know, tool sets available, but it's also about how we deal with those tools, and it's about the kind of maturity that we bring to um, our tool usage. And I think Foss already mentioned you know some of the disciplines of software engineering. I think that's really important. It's very easy for us to tinker and um, you know be uh, uh, write snippets of code here, there, and everywhere in, uh, in notebooks, uh, as opposed to you know rigorous testing, rigorous documentation, um, you know rigor rigor to the way in which we conduct our own experiments and evaluate. Them. I think those are those are important disciplines that have to go together with um, with the tooling. Great. Um, and Alexei, could I come to you on this? How has the explosion of data driven the need for new tools in data science? Uh, yes, of course. So um, the uh, data science now is. Uh, 
basically penetrated all aspects of uh, financial uh, uh, industry and other industries as well. And uh, there are tons of tools uh, available, high level and low level tools. And I think what's uh, what's very important here and uh, partially what is driving this uh, uh, this uh, evolution and progress here is that uh, the tools need to be interoperable and easily integratable. Uh, and uh, what uh, we are trying to do is to integrate uh, the data science into our products as well as make our tools that we're available, uh, we make available to our clients uh, data science friendly and expose them in a way which uh, uh, would make easy for users to uh, take them and plug them into some uh, open source frameworks and existing uh, frameworks for data science and, uh, and machine learning. So uh, we have a range of tools uh, for that. And uh, these are actually very popular, especially ones which expose our libraries through Python. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, I think, what needs to happen is, uh, is the tools need to communicate with each other in a, a, the easiest possible way. Then we'll see even more progress. Uh, great. Um, I don't know if you saw the question from the audience here. Um, I thought you might like to touch on that. Um, so uh, someone says that it's very easy to find open source tools to throw at machine learning, um, to throw machine learning at data. But then what actually matters is the interpretation of results and domain knowledge experience. Do you agree with that? Yes, you 100 agree. With that, I agree. Say? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I think we're all in we're all in violent agreement with that statement. Uh, right. Everybody okay. can tinker and uh, play around with it, uh, but it's uh, it's how you actually interpret and what you really do with it. Fantastic. Um, okay, and then um, perhaps coming uh, back to you, Victor, on on the on this question of of how data has driven the need for these tools. Right, so the, you cannot uh, destroy the dancing that an algorithm, technology, and usage do, right? What do I mean by that? If you know the story of big data, Google file system was the predecessor of the Hadoop file system, right? Why Google invented that? They had such a good search algorithm that they say, we need better technology. They push the Google file system, and then people open source it, created Hadoop, and now we know Hadoop as it is now. Today, Hadoop is not enough. Why? Because the algorithms now need faster decision making, it's way more data, and Hadoop is way too expensive to run internally. So now you have the new paradigm of S3 buckets, distributed, federated learning, and that's the dancing. You have the research pushing a new algorithm, now you need the tech to support the algorithm, and then you redo those things. Like something as simple as a linear regression made in Spark, that is a distributed, uh, paradigm versus a linear regression made as a linear algebra inverse matrix are way two different things, but they have to yield the same results. So as you see problems emerging that are harder and harder, the algorithm needs to keep up, the technology needs to keep up, and both evolve at the, at the same kind of pace or, or dance. One thing that I want to uh, quote from Francois is the alternative data. Now we know, or at least we have seen that there's alpha in alternative data. Satellite images of, it's really famous this example. If you take satellite images of places that people shop in, now you predict how the demand is coming and then you can do some alpha prediction into the future. There's a lot of research on that. But it means that you have to take images, process the images, draw conclusions from them, store them, put them into production and run that thing 24 seven for someone to consume. It's a huge tech stack in order to support that. So one thing that, that I hope also people realize is that you don't need a tool, you need an ecosystem. Software engineering for AI is real, it's a niche and it's a specialization where you need engineers thinking of a system in order to support data scientists. Please don't hire a data scientist and say, hey, do your thing, because if the data scientist is good enough, the person knows algorithm, but they don't know software engineer. So think of those things in order for you to drive a successful organization into, into the future. Great. Um, thanks so much, Victor. And um, now we, and we'll touch on that a little bit more later as well. Um, but we're going to just turn to our second poll question. Um, and that's been live for a little while. So 
I'll just read it out, but perhaps you can, you know, make the uh, the results uh, push those out already. Um, so the question was um, um, to the audience whether that where they were using data science tools. Um, so whether in systematic market making, algorithmic trading, risk management and compliance, or regulatory reporting. Um, and it looks like um, people are using the, these tools predominantly in risk management and compliance. Um, I don't know if that's sort of a reflection of our audience here. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, um, would, um, would uh, Alex say, would you have uh, any reaction to this? Are you surprised by that? I'm, I'm uh, a little bit surprised, but I think it's also uh, the, this result is slightly biased, uh, perhaps by uh, uh, by uh, the uh, subject of this uh, uh, webinar, because uh, because it it has risk management in in, in the title. But uh, uh, I believe that uh, um, fields like systematic market making and algorithm trading uh, are fully based on uh, on data science and AI, right? So uh, so uh, as we as we all know, uh, there is hardly any thing that has uh, not been touched uh, by by these technologies these days so uh, but uh, I, I can I can see that uh, uh, the perhaps the most value uh, on the pricing valuation side can be uh, extracted in risk management uh, especially where you need to uh, uh, run uh, highly complex uh, calculations uh, on uh, large portfolios uh, large data sets uh, uh, big simulations, and uh, that's where the uh, the data science uh, can can probably give you the most uh, gains. Fantastic. Um, so if now I, we kind of sorry, have a... if I could just say, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. I, I have to say, I, I'm really surprised by the outcome. Um, okay. I'm, or it should maybe just me being foolish, but I um, I had always kept in the back of my mind, and clearly it means that I'm from getting old and have too much gray hair. But I, I'd always assumed that algorithmic trading was much more rules-based uh, than uh, than uh, using machine learning. Uh, so, uh, and that that's simply a question of latency. You know, so uh, that, that 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 was my assumption. It clearly proven wrong here. Um, but and the other thing that really surprises me is that regulatory reporting has come up so high. Um, you know, if if that if I if you'd asked me. Uh, I would have thought that's kind of the last place where I'd expect uh, machine learning to come in. Uh, so uh, you're clearly being wrong here, but I am surprised. And it's, uh, you, you learn something new every day, but uh, that, that's a inter really interesting outcome as far as I'm concerned. Oh, great. Um, uh, well, that's fantastic. Um, so um, we'll just move on now to sort of uh, why we we so we've talked about why we need these tools and where they can deliver benefits but let's let's get down to brass tacks as in the tools that firms are actually using and maybe michael uh you could start us off here so what data science tools are you using to deliver insights and inform decisions from this data so um yeah, we have a couple of constraints so we have um you know we, we have we we have two uh two cloud and uh, providers for us and we in many cases are kind of restricted mainly to their tool sets um then um obviously we have the usual the standard tooling that everybody has you know, we use everything most of our experimental work for sure works on databricks um then we have you know, the, the usual tooling like tensorflow and scikit-learn and all these these things are in, in deployment I would say there's nothing in our tool set that isn't um, extremely well known and understood, and that isn't a total commodity out there. Uh, and I think to many, to a certain extent, that's also the power of this that uh, you know, that enables us to move from one place to another and to look at different problems that in using the same tooling. So I think it's on the one hand it seems kind of limiting, but on the other hand it is one of the the, the things that gives us the power of flexibility. Fantastic. And Alexey, um, maybe I could come back to you in terms of what tools um, firms are using. Uh, there was also a question for you um, from the audience to explain more 
of the alpha created for liquid assets is this relevant as private markets and credit have grown so much uh, uh yes sure so these are two very separate questions but uh, the in terms of the uh, the value created uh, for extraction of alpha for illiquid assets uh, uh, obviously um, data science and machine learning tools can uh, do a lot of stuff that uh, that humans were not able to do uh, before simply because uh, we have uh, now, uh, like I was saying before, almost unlimited capacity to analyze uh, huge amounts of structured and unstructured data. And uh, uh, this allows uh, uh, establishing, uh, establishing uh, connections between uh, factors which uh, would not, uh, which a human would not be uh, able to even think about but uh, a machine learning model for example can analyze uh, massive amounts of uh, let's say financial uh, factors uh, such as price histories economic data fundamentals etc with combined with the non-financial factors like uh, twitter chats for example and uh, other behavioral type data and create uh, uh, predictions or valuations uh, based on that so this is something which uh, would not have been possible uh, before but it is possible now so of course uh, the data science is driving uh, this type of uh, uh, research and that uh, that leads to alpha extraction for especially for the liquid assets for which you don't have observable prices and to answer the second uh, questions about the tools uh, so yeah uh, there we we have a broad range of tools available now to explore uh, and apply data science in, in all kinds of applications. And, and they range from very, very high level tools like TensorFlow, like was mentioned before, um, uh, to much lower level specific uh, packages addressing some data mining problems. You can class all of that as data science tools. Uh, what, um, uh, what I think is important is that uh, uh, we, uh, software providers like ourselves, uh, make it easier to, uh, and uh, at a higher level, uh, um, higher level uh, tools for for the users that allow you to save time on uh, doing simple things. So, for example, we have uh, developed a, a framework which we call DSP, Data Science Platform within Quantify, which allows for a very easy way of passing a complex calibrated uh, objects between different parts of our ecosystems. Uh, so you can pass uh, curves or volatility surfaces or representations of trade and product uh, data uh, between uh, parts of the application, some of them may be cloud-based, some of them may be uh, uh, running in the local environment, which makes it uh, very easy to analyze uh, uh, portfolios and data uh, outside of the main uh, pricing and reporting system and uh, saves tons of time for, for our clients. So, so these types of tools are gaining popularity and it's a very interesting uh, uh, subject for us. Great. Uh, thanks, Alexei. Um, and then, Victor, um, what, what is your experience? How, how, uh, how is JP Morgan Chase using uh, these tools? Yeah, as Michael is oh, saying, it's so, so commoditized that normally there's no interchange in it. It's more how do you approach the problem that you are solving. Now, you have to acknowledge that one, let's say, important variable is the operating model that you provide in the ecosystem. For example, Alexei was quoting, hey, we recognize there are some strange artifacts that need to be passed around. So when you recognize that from your operating model, you can build the glue things that or the glue mechanisms that will pass one thing to another to another because there's a life cycle to it. So think of software development life cycle. Now everyone is talking of machine learning development life cycle where you provide the tooling the things where you can deploy models faster, faster, and faster. So, so you have storage capabilities, computing capabilities, data science capabilities, and then a regulatory kind of framework in order for for manage the risk. So, so it's literally no different than any other uh, place or tool. Fantastic. Um, and uh, and then finally, François. Um, what, what's the regulator's view on some of these solutions? For example, ag uh, algorithmic execution. Um, what's the view of regulators in terms of these tools being used for best execution, for example? Okay, well, maybe just to uh, 
to, to mention that I was working for a Canadian regulator before, so I can a bit give a, a sense of what regulator may think. So on the other side, uh, so uh, I mean, algorithmic uh, trading it's maybe uh, more complicated, or there are debates within regulators like, uh, do you need to see uh, to understand the code? Uh, to, to see what are the potential risks uh, from the training algorithm that you may use and so on. So uh, it's much more like a debate uh, in the U.S. than elsewhere, but nevertheless. Uh, but, but I think, uh, not to necessarily answer specifically the question about uh, best execution, I think the re regulator view, generally speaking, on machine learning, uh, uh, data science and so on, it's when those tools are uh, deployed into production and when they perform a customer facing so uh, a regulated activities uh, the regulators will uh, step up to uh, okay maybe at some point to put a framework uh, but also they need to better understand what are those things so all regulators around the world i can definitely say that they are definitely uh, improving in terms of the skill uh, that they got experience on data science and so on. They massively hire a lot of data scientists uh, as well. Uh, keep in mind that regulators usually do have a lot of uh, a lot of data because they are able to have access to the full uh, market uh, overview. Unlike uh, unlike uh, any firm, even a very large uh, sell side uh, firm. Uh, but um, and also regulators do use it a lot as well. So it's kind of uh, all the topic about, uh, for example, explainability and so on is also a topic that regulators do face for their own. Uh, so it's, I guess, a question of everyone, the industry overall, over, uh, um, I mean, everyone is like trying to make progress on this. What, for example, is the best ex explainability approach that we could have? Uh, what, uh, so what will be the best execution in the case of, uh, for example, when you do apply more perhaps machine learning based solution and so on. I guess it's a broad answer to your question. Great. Um, and now we come to perhaps like the trickiest question for firms on how they can implement these tools in their organization. And Victor, I'd like to come back to you on this as we sort of started or you'd started a bit of a discussion on the kind of ecosystem that you need to support these use cases. So how do you introduce or begin to implement data science or AI or machine learning tools within your firm? Right. Uh, one thing that you should recognize, or at least from, from a personal perspective, is that when I don't know something, I allocate what I call the risky allocation to it, meaning that you should understand that it's a new capability. If you haven't done it before, it can fail. And if you read Gartner reports, you know that 97% of AI projects don't go to production. So you're basically, ex whatever you expect from a value, multiply by 3%, and that's the expected actual value that you are going to yield from the risky dollars that you invest on it. Now, how can you make the most out of the experiment that you are building is recognize that it's a capability and as a capability needs a full support system, meaning you need software engineers, you need data scientists, and you need orchestrators or PMs or whatever, because we also have to agree that data scientists, we love to think, and meaning that when we think, we keep thinking and thinking and thinking, and someone say, hey, hey, watch it, let's time box this and let's deliver. So, so that's something that you have to be aware of. And ideally, by POCs. Hey, we have a problem that high level, we can attack by data science, can we make it happen? You get into production, now you build what Google calls MLOps 1.0. So MLOps 1.0 is how can you actually conceptually create an idea, create a model, deploy it to production and support it. You know how to do that. Okay, now you learn how to do that in your ecosystem because I will guess every company has their own technical uh, particularities. Now, do you want to scale it? Because it's also a question. No, I don't like it. I'm enough with software engineering or I will outsource to any SaaS system. But you say, no, you know what? I really want to invest in it. This is my thing. I see the value. Okay, now that you have learned, let's scale, let's optimize. That's how I will approach the problem if I have to redo it all over again. Great. Um, we're going to have to wrap up uh, this section uh, a little bit more quickly. So 
unless anyone else has some burning comments to make, Alex, say, I'll, I'll come to you and ask you, you know, what are some of the tools that firms are using to help them implement AI and machine learning driven deep learning algorithms and integrate them with complex financial modeling? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so like, I, like I said, uh, uh, there is a huge uh, range of tools available and depends on uh, on the level of uh, abstraction that you want to uh, to get into. You have tools uh, which allow you to put together a machine learning model in a few lines of code and uh, you have uh, uh, you have tools uh, which are basically programming frameworks uh, um, th that uh, that you can write uh, your own uh, models uh, in if you if you wanted to but uh, uh, some of the tools that uh, that I think uh, the industry needs are the ones that uh, that allow easier integration of the existing uh, technologies and uh, methodologies with the modern uh, frameworks uh, which employ data science and machine learning. Great, uh, thanks, Alexei. And uh, so we now we've sort of dealt with the crux of which tools, um, where and how, but. What about the human factor and how is the role of humans evolving along with the advances in data science? Um, and perhaps I can start with you, Michael, and, um, and ask, you know, how are the needs of the current market and advances in data science driving the change in skill sets and job func functions required by these firms or by your firm? <laughs> I, I think there's, um, there's, a, there's a couple of things that, that uh, sort of, uh, in, in in play. So, uh, I, I if you've listened actually to the introductions that people gave to to this hour here, um, you, you've, there's already a whole bunch of techniques that 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 were mentioned that are kind of much more novel and, and are rising to prominence. Now, I think sort of traditionally we've we've very much been regression type people, and you know other other sort of supervised uh, uh, techniques. Um, I don't remember who it was, but one of us mentioned reinforcement learning earlier, and, and I think that that's become a much more accepted and interesting tool set uh, that, that that or skill set that 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 we that we want to deploy. So that that there's there's definitely a dynamic there. Um, somebody posted a comment earlier on, uh, but then deleted it on the large language model um, uh, that, that's been in the press over the last couple of days. So those are those are definitely areas that are also of interest. There's a lot of a lot of things happening, and I think if if anything, the um, the, the the rate of change in our profession is just staggering. So the the single most important skill set that that we're really looking for is to stay sharp and stay at the uh, at the leading edge of um, all these developments that are happening out there. Great, thank you, Michael. And um, and Francois, just to wrap up here, would you have anything to add on on what the challenges are for firms in terms of deep, deeper expertise needed in their workforce? I, I think it's what Michael just mentioned at the end. It's just learning, actually. So it's not just about machine learning; it's actually human learning and to upskill uh, to to upskill uh, the existing uh, workforce. It's a lot of. Uh, Institutions are doing it, like the CFA, for example, institution is doing it as well, uh, like talking on machine learning and so on. But yes, definitely, this is the biggest challenge for firms, at least when it's a question about uh, data science and also uh, about uh, data governance, data quality, which is not a topic that we didn't necessarily mention, but uh, it's also a big, a big challenge. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we've got the, the results of the third poll question. Um, so what's driving data science investment securities? Um, and it looks like most people uh, think that people are driving it. Um, so so that's interesting. And um, uh, Michael, would you, would you Sorry, Zoe, you, you were just breaking up as, as you were talking. I, I, you asked me to comment on the poll. Um, yeah, that's right, so on the results the, there. So we have 47% of people uh, of the audience think that people are driving data science. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, and it, it comes back to some of the 
the questions that have been asked in the chats uh, on and off. I think people, uh, obviously, people like us are the, the sort of the main proponents of it. Uh, but people are also humans are also our main opponents, and it's uh, the people that our people that we need to convince of the value of what we do by you know, um, showing small pieces of value iteratively that we can then expand and and uh, and extend across uh, uh, across our areas of activity. So uh, I think the people element is really important, um, and to a certain extent. I hate to say that, but to a certain extent, we are all salespeople of our skill set, um, and, and trying to still trying to convince um, everyone that what we're doing is actually the right approach. Um, so we're, I'm fighting a daily fight against sort of people who think stochastic models are the the bee's knees and uh, not realizing that the world has moved on. So um, I, I definitely take the poll uh, as as a really good uh, reflection of what I'm thinking too. Fantastic. And uh, I'm sorry, that's all we have time for uh, today. And um, it only remains for me to thank our illustrious panel for their insights and thank Quantify as our sponsors of this risk.net webinar. And of course, thank you for listening. Uh, you can find more on this topic at risk.net. Goodbye for now. <laughs>